Welcome to Goalie Science, the podcast that bridges the gap between goal setting, science, and peak performance. I'm your host, Jamie Phillips, a former professional goalie, currently pursuing a doctorate in physical therapy and specializing in goalie performance coaching. Joining me as always is Dr. Ben Cernick, a seasoned goalie coach and sports analytics specialist. Whether you find yourself at home, on the road, or at the rink, grab a cup of your favorite beverage and let's drop the puck on this week's episode. Jamie, we are back for another day here. And before we say anything, I need you and I need everyone listening to manifest me getting equipment. We're manifesting new gear for me. I have a tournament at the end of April. What do I need to do to make that happen? How do I get myself the latest set of whatever pads, top end stuff? What am I doing? Question. So first, we... There was talk. I I was talking to like a an agent and social media guy. And there were there were there was interest for some brands, and it kind of fell through. I don't know what happened to that, so I might have to pick that up. But are you open to any brand sponsoring sponsoring and you and allowing you to wear their gear in some sort of tournament? I would wear any equipment with any logo on it. Don't care. Okay. I am. So, I mean, I, I think you've probably seen this too. Obviously, gear is a preference thing. Um, yeah. I will say this, that pretty much anyone making modern equipment, any major company, even the smaller companies, all the new stuff is like so much above even what, what we wore four or five years ago. Like the quality. Yeah. The, like you're gonna, it's going to be, it's the, gonna be little nuances, but for the most part, it's going to feel, it's going to feel pretty similar. And so I think if, if a company wants to reach out and help that out, we will do segments, we'll do gear reviews, we'll do, we'll do the necessary social media promotion. The longest bet has some gear. I am, it's a fucking fresh. I am prepared to, I'm prepared, I'm actually thinking about doing this regardless, but I'm prepared to go pro the whole tournament I'm in. Just let the people see, can I still kick it? And the answer yeah. is, I don't know, I'm feeling strangely confident about my performance which is so misguided now yeah so i'm gonna say like that's not always the best thing no i'm coming in I mean, here's the thing um i mean i think like a lot of goalie coaches but i think but think about goalie during the season how much how much are they on the ice per, per, per week will we say what's a reasonable amount of ice like for minor hockey junior hockey like a couple for states a week couple games like you're looking five like, times you're looking at like two to three practice this two to three games probably on average okay i am on the i'm on the ice for three to four practices a day think of how i have maximized my training <laughs> while coaching this whole time think of all of the demos i've done out of the track salute butterfly slides like the amount, you know, the amount of osmosis of the game that you have right now just absorbing yeah everything. exactly Exactly. So the so the point is being here. We're manifesting. So everyone, we're manifesting hats on. Um, we're manifesting new gear, new gear videos, and uh, me in a dominating men's league performance in in six weeks. So everybody, fuck her up. Oh, yes, six weeks. Oh, we got so much time. Yeah, practice. that's that's why I say we're manifesting, right? I'm oh, even. Yeah. Should I even go for a training skate? Like, do you think I should go for a? Jamie, when are you back in town? Should I skate with you? I actually will be back in town five weeks exactly from, like, I guess this weekend. Just, we didn't talk about this at all before the show. Let's do it. We're going to make right. it work. Let me go work. Right. We'll figure it out. I'm doing that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll pay for the ice. How about that? I'm not paying you, though. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, you can afford me anyways. Uh, just come to you know, you just come to Grand Rapids and then just skate. Actually, that's actually not a bad idea. All right, we're going to talk about that for now. But anyone, everyone get your manifesting hats on. Um, think about it not just for me, but for for the for the content, right? Yeah, and the thing is, too, is if if this happens, and then I will I will put my editing hat on for Ben and do a good job editing. Thing. I've actually spent the waking hours I have between coaching, school, clinic, running the multiple businesses i have been putting some time into editing better Why better not? not and so yeah i will i'll edit you i'll, I'll edit it up for you 
Thanks, man. Uh, All right. Ben, before we get to today's topic, um, we apologize for no video today. That's that's completely on me. But I do want to say two things. So as as basically an expat of Canada, yeah. Um, I mean, I think I'm in a gray area here, but um, where I don't really feel American, but I don't feel as Canadian as I used to. Not a big fan that roll up the rim is on my it's on app now. So the rim, it's terrible. It's awful. I don't want to talk about it. I hate it. Pretty choked sure about that when I went to get a cup and I was expecting to be able to play and I couldn't roll it up. And then I wasn't going to do it. like go back through the drive through and be like, where, where's my shot at the prize? Uh, and then that I bought another coffee that you're eating right now and didn't win, obviously. So not told with that. Number two, if there are the three things America really eats right now when it comes to uh, food and snacks. Yep. Number one, coffee crisp coffee crisp is such a good chocolate bar nope but it's so good uh it is. obviously ketchup chips yeah for sure I don't, I don't like them but i super appeal so ketchup chips oh, i think ketchup chips are 10 out of 10 uh if Again. a close a close substitute is if you go to trader joe's you could get powdered you get like ketchup seasoning and put on your popcorn similar thing and then the third I, I think it's about a tie between like all dress chips and hickory sticks. You know what? A good hickory stick goes a long way, Jamie. It honestly does. It really, really does. That's just, that was just on my mind. That's my little, you know, my little expat thought. But I, it was more like a lot of the disappointment that roll up the rib is at base now because I also feel like, I feel like you can, sh- like something's going, it's like, you know, like can you go like think about online. You know, so you're like, yep. Oh, this is an algorithm figuring this out. You like heard. someone coded this algorithm. It's one thing to play, like, you know, you go and play roulette or whatever, and yeah, obviously the odds are always skewed in the favor of the house. Sure is. See the ball if you're a guy with evil eye. You're like, hey, this guy's doing something shady. When you have a physical cup in your hand, it's either it's either a win, it's a yes or a no, it's fighter. And now I don't like, I don't whatever the algorithm is, I don't like it. I don't trust it. I don't trust in one bit. All right, so we've got manifesting equipment, new takes that Jamie can't have in America, and now conspiracy theories around Tim Hortons roll out the rim to win campaign. These are all <laughs> vitally important and very girly related topics. Well, think about all the Canadian and American, for depending on which state you live in, who go to Tim Hortons daily. Like, Tim Hortons what is and was a pregame, like, state. And you know what? They've done a lot to hurt their brand. But until, uh, you know, they take, hey, the off, they take the sugar cube things off their muffins. That's probably the biggest travesty uh, here. All right. That's enough. I'm cutting this off. I'm putting an end to this. I'm done with food talk. So, Jamie, this is the Goalie Size Podcast. If you're still listening and haven't closed this off, thank you very much. You're a true listener. Uh, Jamie, this week we thought yeah. we'd go through micro scenarios. Stuff that we see, we do, we've done this a few times before. It's kind of a recurring, we'll call it a segment. But the basic idea is we talk through some, whether it's debated things or just Steve stuff we've seen coaching or ours watching uh, in some situations where we see goalies doing it differently. And sometimes it's good different, sometimes it's bad different. But altogether, these are the scenarios where we're seeing um, maybe like a lack of congruency on like what's the best way to go about it or maybe some ways that I think people can improve it. So let's just get right into it. Um, we've talked about this before for the first micro scenario. I want to bring this back. I want to talk about what is the hesitancy for goalies to use the overlap? Why are goalies hesitant to use it? What do you think? Um, so obviously, again, they, like all the questions we have here, it's nuanced and stuff. But um, the biggest thing that I see is goalies don't, they don't like not knowing where they are. The they don't like being lost. And a lot of times... We think about, I mean, a lot of it's, it, it is changing to a degree. And, and I've made a very conscious effort about changing this in the way I coach. But for a long time, and for like a lot of coaches, you know, everything starts from the post when it's doing trails. But the yeah. post, that about like always a starting point. There's a defined A to a defined B mm-hmm. where some goalies will have that, you know, spatial awareness. They'll understand where they are at their crease. Bet. Some goalies don't. And so what I've been doing is starting a lot of things in an overlap or you have to retreat to an overlap and then step out. 
And if they miss, I do it again, do it again, do it again, just to train that. So I think a lot of that hesitancy is they bullies don't know how far outside they are at their post, outside their parallels. Are they on angle? Are they off angle? So in order, they need a point of safety. So they default right to the post. That way they at least know where they are, even if that isn't the ideal position to be. That's why I found. Ben, what about you? Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's like a really, really good way of looking at it. Um, the other thing that I've noticed a lot is goalies get really, really nervous about what about that back door pass or the mode in an overlap. And I just really think that pivot push isn't that big of a deal if you're in the right spot in an overlap. So what I think that I mean by that is I think goalies are sometimes too aggressive in that overlap position. And what I mean by that is like if we, if we think about you know, those round creases. So let's throw away the pro crease, which is a little more squared off, right? Those, those, you know, those true half circle or semicircle creases. I see goalies yeah. who are like toes are in the white ice in those semicircle creases in an overlap. And that's just an unnecessarily aggressive position to be in. Uh, that's like not where you need to be when it comes to an overlap. You can be essentially about three, four inches in front of your post and you're covering the same amount of net exactly, right? Yeah. The net's not very wide there. So the number one thing that I'm seeing is I think goalies are scared of, well, what can I still use an overlap if there's a back rear option or a pass option? I think you can. In fact, I think like I still would recommend it most of the time to be in an overlap because again, something that I believe in, and I guess I'll throw two questions your way is I'm a firm believer in a goaltender's approach needs to be, I'm going to play the shot and I'm going to give myself a chance on the pass. It's not, you know, take the shot. And at all costs, it's no, you need to still give yourself a chance on that other option. Um, but I think goalies are doubting their abilities to play that secondary option in an overlap and they shouldn't, I think it's a better play than they realize. So what do you think about that? I agree. Uh, I have a, a rule or a saying, I say 90, 10, uh, a little bit different from the 80, 20 rule, where I say 90% of your focus needs to be on the shot and say like an overlap situation, 10% of your focus. Now that big, big kind of focus, not positioning, needs to be on the ability to get across. A hundred percent of your positioning should be on on the shot. Yep. Uh, and this 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 comes down to us as coaches. We need to we have to analyze the game, the game in general, as well as the game of each our striking weaknesses of each individual goalie and the levels they're playing at, the situations their teams give up, and say, okay, like what are they getting the most? And how can we train this at one of their weaknesses? So I, for those like goalies that skate with me consistently, we do so much overlap work, whether that's overlap to RVH, overlap mm-hmm. to step out, overlap to back door, because that is just a position, a situation that happens all the time. Like so many times, time. so many times. So but just players can't, the defensemen, ju- like they're taught to cut down, they stop, sorry, prevent the forward F1 from cutting to the middle. Okay, mm-hmm. so if they're gonna, the D does a good job and they can't cut to the middle, that D is going to have to drive wide, or sorry, that four is going to have to drive wide and make a play from the wall or somewhere outside the dot lane. So usually you end up in an overlap, and that's just, at almost, like, that's a large percentage of the entries. So I think that that's um, pretty normal, but that, that comes down to us. Like, you know, if a goalie lacks the ability to get across in that backdoor save, we need to, you know, reverse engineer what's happening. You know, why are they not getting across? Is it a re- is it a physiological thing? Like, do they just lack the power or the flexibility or the ability to rotate their hips? You know, are they leading with the head and not with their chest? And that way their is bad. So like thinking there's about a million things it could be, but that's up to us as coaches to be able to identify and then train that either the bad habits out or add in the necessary ways to do it. But right. this is, I'm going to immediately side change this. So I agree with all that. And I think that actually puts a nice little little bow on that one. I think it's just a comfort thing. And I think we can just expose girls or give them more opportunities to just encourage the use of the overlap. It is ultimately a good position to use. Um, and it really limits unnecessary RVH or post plays or awkward goals. I think the number one thing it does for younger girls is it just limits the bad like squeaker because you're on your post and can't butterfly goal, which is a, is a killer for confidence for younger goalies. It's also a killer for confidence for older goalies if you're getting beaten in an RVH from 35 feet away. Um, yeah, and, and, it's, and I'm going to add in one thing here. It goes back to like what I do. At, the goalies that skate with me can attest to this, where I start a lot of drills, not even really in a overlap, but well, 
not in an overlap off the post, but I put them in an overlap with their blade touching the outside of the net. Yep, I do and I too. say, I say, find your post. And then they always look at me like, what? And I say, find your post without looking down at your feet, without becoming super off square off angle, making sure you're looking up ice. And, and then they go, how do I do that? And I usually honestly just say, figure it out. Because I need them to try it and understand, okay, like I ended up outside my post, like too far. I don't need to panic. I just need to return to the house or adjust myself without throwing everything off and getting into these little positions where oftentimes a goalie will panic. And I gotta get, gotta work that out of them, get rid of that sense of panic. So goalies are you know, confident when, you know, when poop hits the fan, as they say. Yes, I agree. Um, the thing I was going to call you out on, and I think call you out, it's the wrong way of doing it. You know what I'll lean with your chest thing, Jamie? You're, I want to make it clear that you're right. Like, you need to lead with your body to the puck um, and, you know, not just stare at it and then never pivot. But, like, you you got you to gotta look, Jamie. I hate your chest. I mean, I mean, you're, I hate your lean with the chest. I hate it. I hate it so much. Well, first, number one, if you don't look, you still don't know where to aim your chest. Number two, try moving your chest independent of your head. It's very difficult. Your head is way to come. No, I know why you're saying it. I'm not saying it's a rational choice by me. I'm just saying I don't like it. I agree with the principle. Right? Well, I, you don't. You, you can use whatever cues you want to use. That's the cue that. I took the huge that the one that I look because it's the easiest to explain. It's easiest to explain to kids because I could show them, have them demonstrate their head independently, and then try to move their upper body independent of their head. How difficult it is, and then we just go into skating efficiency. That's probably the biggest thing that you know that I that I have harped on and one of my kind of my bread and butter is for it's crazy for someone who's a horrible skater. I've been good at getting guys to be good at skating guys and girls and it's all about you know being able to control the hips and the knees and the ankles through that torso rotation and so by get I like the, the sound effects i'm going to use and you'll know what i got on the sound probably gonna laugh but it's like as soon as someone's about to push they usually go push yep. if i can get rid of push and turn that into one movement i'm now taking two or three steps and turning into one and that is a split second faster that may result in more saves over time which results in, you know better save percentage and wins etc etc so you can use whatever cue you want problem is when i say lead with the head the chest often trails behind the goalies end up off square off angle and most and i think most times especially when they're sliding they have horrible lines and then they give up goals. And then they're like, well, I led with my head. I'm like, yeah, but you can look at the puck and have everything be off angle and off square. It doesn't matter. And so I need to instill that idea and that body control and awareness early on with my goalies before someone, like, before they go somewhere else and they learn kind of bad habits that I have to try to, like, regain them back out, that that makes sense. Do you think you're better than look, pivot, push. Do you think you ascended above the RPP, the gold yes. standard of teaching? Yeah, depending on what age. Uh, someone is just beginning, probably not. But when it comes to most goalies that have the basics, I, I don't use look, pivot, push because it takes too long. When, I, when I'm skating with a confident skater and a, a good goalie, it takes too long to, for them to think about look, pivot, push. I need them to... The thing that I work on a lot is I need them to be able to look while they're pushing, look and push. So they identify as they're moving. So either whether that play has happened out of their peripheral vision, they understand, okay, that puck is now towards somewhere block or side. So as they're rotating, they're able to adjust, adjust in real time, push on angle and they're on angle on the proper line, end up square, save that fraction of the time that would have been lost through that look pivot push kind of method and there but for young kids yeah like young kids that they can barely stand up you gotta say yeah turn your head okay now push turn your head now push but you know it, it just you have to tailor your coaching to the skill of the goalie in front of you 
Yeah, I mean, I, well, this is, again, I set this up all to say that I don't think, uh, I think ultimately everyone's just saying the same thing. Uh, it's just differently. And I, I think yeah, Luna yes, has a chance. Yes, no, no. yes and no, though, because I've had some only coaches uh, kind of argue about the lead of the chest. And yeah, is, it, say, is it me? Is that is that goalie coaches? Is it me? No, it is not. It is not you. And uh, and so I've had some good discussions with it. And like like I said, like I'll 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 bring the receipts for the difference in, in movements. But that's you know that but that's my nuance. That's my coaching style. Everyone's going to be different. And so but so far, like for me, you can't really argue with some of the the biomechanics of it when. You know when it's applied properly, but it some but for some goalies they don't pick it up that easily, and that's okay. It just takes a long time to understand and kind of adjust to that sort of different feeling of moving. And so that's where you know I think the juice is worth the squeeze if you put in the time and effort to be able to save a fraction of a second with all your movements throughout a game. And I'm here to say for those who uh, those goalies listening who are, are not actively thinking about leading with your chest i think it's also fine i think if your goal is to look and get your chest to the puck which like ultimately should be your goal regardless um i think yeah i think you'll have to do a little bit of a semantics one i i open this can of worm hands up this one's on me yeah you know it's just like some people teach skate on post and i'm very much against skate on post in honestly all situations yeah i don't think you should teach skate on post that's just to take there's a lot of things but some people will be like no you absolutely have to and the risk of getting beat on a wraparound is not is very much outweighed by the ability to push off the post. And I would I would disagree with that. But that's, again, like, you go to coaches that you tend to agree with. Mm-hmm. If you don't agree with them, you usually go to coaches otherwise. Or if you really don't agree with them, you got to be like, hey, like, this is what I like to do. And that's, that's it. Like, when I was in Finland, one of the goalies there, he's like, my goalie coach says because of my hips, I have to have shit on post. And I was like, okay, uh, I, I vastly disagree. But if that's what you like and you are super comfortable with that, then let's work around it. And you know, it's funny because he messaged me halfway through the season. He said, and he's like, yeah, I switched to lace on post, and everything is better now. And I was like, okay, well, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that, and I'm glad that it probably took you giving up some goals and learning and trying. To understand that what you were doing when it would not was definitely not the best way. Like I actually would have hit would rather him go stay on post than chin on post. But now know, that's it. now that's a take. Two Rask just ran over in his proverbial and he's, he's alive. So but you know. Yeah, but yeah, but that's you know, that's I guess an opinion and that's my take. But I don't know. It's variance between professionals and their opinions and whatever works that for some people you know, if skate and post really works for you and you're adamant about it and you don't want to do it the other way, sure. But when I beat you there against the post, I'm going to sell the ER. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I understand it. I mean, I think this is, again, this was not on the docket for what I was hoping to speak about today, but I think it, it naturally leads itself this way. Is I think, um, I think skate on post as a concept is a little bit of a, disservice and i'll let me kind of finish this i think you're going to agree with it but i think the issue with skate on post and part of it comes down to coaching philosophy is we teach goalies rbh and post positions pretty young these days and it's not that you should be sitting in an rbh when you're 11 or 12 because you're you don't cover the net and rbh is a bit of a waiting position although i would argue that it's becoming a little more active than it used to be and it should be a little more active which i like Yep, but I think one of the greatest limitations to properly teaching it, so girly, goalie, I was like, oh, like girlies, geez, girlies start using skate on post is a product of equipment. It's a product of their equipment. So a young girlie doesn't have a sufficient skate lace gap for where they had to really sit on the post comfortably. So they'll go skate on post or shin on post because there isn't an anchoring place for them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and like, but no, I was just gonna say that's, but again, like that's our like like that's our job as coaches to identify that if we're teaching it, obviously. And if someone isn't, then you kind of just learn through trial and error. But I do, I do think that with the content that well, some goalie coaches are putting out, 
myself included, there's a lot more like technical analysis stuff um, where we there's like a, coaches are like explaining some of the why between things. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot less like kind of like hush hush where it's like, oh, we have the secret because the yeah, secret yeah. is there is no secret. Oh. But um, but I think that that helps. But again, like, like some but also at the same time, I've been getting a lot of goalies that are like so overthinking things too, mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, my skate lace isn't 44 billion years. Like, hey, like, okay, sure. But, you know, just maybe try this or try that. And you can't always, unless you're measuring it with a ruler, but it just seems like at some point it's like, okay, like your skate lace is, or your bungee is just too long or it's just too short. So Goldilocks it, you know, find somewhere in the middle that works. Yeah, I just think that's like an important distinction is that like sometimes when we're learning something, whether we're 12 or 15 or 18 or 20, sometimes we have to ensure that there's nothing like that's being prohibitive to the learning process, right? And I think an example of teaching, I, I was going to say proper RVH, but really it's just proper pad on post positioning can sometimes be equipment in younger girls. So, you know, setting just to be mindful, making sure like if you're having a tough time, again, this is older girls too, if you're having a tough time getting a really consistent seal, into that post um, with the boot of your pad or in between, I should say, with the boot and the skate, the cap of the skate. Just make sure that gap on your skate is not problematic, too tight. Look, those are too much ankle torque. Now, a lot of modern gear uh, lets your ankle sit pretty loose and pretty freely, so that's not as much of a problem as it used to be, but it still exists. It's still there. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I'll go back. I'll go to my micro scenario now, right. and this one, uh, I don't know if it's, it's more, it's more macro, but I think a lot of it is goalies, goalies not paying attention as much when that plays at the other end to mm. notice a situation developing and stepping out at the right time. So I think we spoke with, about this with Bouge maybe a year or two ago. That was the first thing he worked on. But I noticed when I was watching uh, a couple high school games and it was, whether the goalie was chasing butterflies or something or just wasn't ready or maybe they just didn't like to do it, is as that play was breaking into the zone, they crossed the blue line, they were just stepping out. And yeah, so the they... puck was moving laterally and they were still moving forward and they had to stop themselves and then play catch up and then have these massive C cuts and then everything was was just thrown out the window. And I'm not even talking about playing a breakaway in this situation because that would fall out the same umbrella, but it's just not having the right depth at the top or outside the crease where you like to stand, identify that that play is entering the zone. Now, I mean, if there's a quick rapid turnover, yeah, you just do what you have to do. But when that play is breaking, like it's coming out from the your offensive zone as the goalie, you need to uh, be aware and identify something is happening. Now it's time to engage and be ready. Yeah, and you know, we did talk about this with Derek before, but I think one of the biggest things in general along with that is I think goalies are just not stepping out early enough, period, like end of discussion. Um, they need to step out. Now, this is actually going to tie in with my last scenario, so maybe we'll just kind of merge these together, Jamie. But I was okay. going to say that I think goalie, I think that there's not a correct um, depth that you need to start on for breakaways or two on ones or rush chances or zone entries. I think that's a very individual process, right? Like some goalies like to have that timing where they retreat or they recoil with the play. Other goalies like to just not really even leave their blue ice very much. Um, and I think all of that can be okay. It, it really ties into your own style and your abilities. But regardless of where the final ending point is once you step off your line i completely agree i don't think goalies are ready enough um as a whole and again i'm grouping goalies as a whole in this situation uh but especially again high school age junior age maybe even honestly in university sometimes i think i was guilty of that definitely at times where i didn't uh for a period of my life i definitely wasn't always consistent about when i wanted to be stepping out but something that i'm definitely more mindful of now and definitely mindful with my goalies but I yeah uh, yeah, I, I am on board with that. The only thing is on breakaways. I'm glad you brought that up because I was debating on using breakaways as my micro situation. Yeah. Um, yes, I got to obviously we always agree that goal setting is very, very gray and it's not black and white. I do think the rule of thumb that you should be 
at the top of your crease, like toes at the top of the crease or like midfoot at the top of the crease, by the time the player gets to the hash mark, for me, is almost a pretty universal rule. I'm fine with that. Yeah, having a decent amount of depth, but still not being so aggressive that you can't push laterally if they cut, as long as you still have some backwards momentum. Uh, so like that's, uh, I like I I've started to put out to my goalies more and more guidelines and huge, huge like shameless plug here. But if you are you do follow up me on Patreon. If you're not this week, there is a breakdown where I I put together a brand new like overlap versus PH versus RVH guidelines. I want to say these are guidelines. They are not black and white rules, but it's something to just be able to answer of some of the questions and allow you to build and expand upon your game. Like turning down on Patreon this week because I just finished editing it today and I'll upload it probably by when you're listening to this, it'll be Wednesday. So it'll probably be up. I'll probably push, put it up today. But I've been putting more and more guidelines just to help answer some of these questions where these rules like should cover most of your bases, essentially. But I like I like that one for breakaways. And breakaways are so hard to teach. And I think like for me, maybe that's just a weakness for me, but I as my in my coaching abilities. But I, I think breakaways are hard to teach because it's just like once you cut the depth and you the goalie understands that you're trying to match the player's speed to mm-hmm. degree with your relative distance backing up. Mm-hmm. It's so much comes down to the goalie's ability to be patient and understand the play and react, hold their feet, all these things. And and I can train some of these aspects, but it's hard to teach. I agree. I think that's like, well, again, we've talked about this and, you know, countless times we've, we've brought up the, the Rob Gray podcast. I think a lot of breakaway work and development is a learn from doing opportunity where you don't want to give too much information to the goalies because they're going to over process and it's not, they're not going to learn from the mistakes they're making. Right. So I'm with you. I think that general idea of like rough distance, like you know, at the top ish of your crease as that player is hitting the, the slot area or the hash work area. I think that's a pretty good run. I don't disagree with that whatsoever. I think some, there's a little bit, again, as always, some wiggle room depending on how each goalie plays that differently. The thing that I think is maybe the most debatable um, is going to be just the starting position for a breakaway, right? So some goalies like you just described or we just described that slot entry position for a forward, a goalie is going to be the top of the crease for that. What about goalies who start their breakaways with their feet in that position? Like, that's their starting spot. How do you feel with that? Uh, I don't... It's one of those ones where if it's not broken, don't fix it. Uh, I don't think it's a problem. The one that I don't love is I think it's the old Marty Turco, but I think Dust Wolf does it now too, where, like, you just kind of, like, fly out as the player is coming in, like, more of a shootout. Yeah. Uh, I just think, like, so few goalies have the edges, they have the ability to be able to handle themselves. And that, so it's one of those ones where it's like, all right, like you want to do this, and it's working for you, sure, absolutely. But like, don't you? Sh- I'm not gonna recommend that goalies do this because it requires a tremendous amount of skating edge work and timing that few goalies have the ability to to consistently reproduce uh, without without errors. So that's kind of the only thing when it comes to breakaways. Goalie wants to start at the top of the blue or whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. As long as they're not getting backed up too much or getting caught flat-footed, whatever works for you. What is your? I have one question, and I have one more thing on breakaways. But what is when you're teaching breakaways to go? Let's say you have two U15 girls, for example. Um, let's say you've never worked with them before, and they want to work on breakaways, and they're like, "Hey, how far should I start out? What is your blanket starting spot? What would you say you should start roughly here? Is a good place to start and try around with?" What would you say? So I, I don't. So if you, the goalie asked me that question, I, I I would go answer back with, "Where do you think you should start?" And yeah, I want to hear. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm cutting you off. No, oh, that is the correct. That's the correct yeah, answer. That, but that's not what we're talking about here. This is not the goalie coach question. This is a personal. You have to give a blanket recommendation to someone. This is hard because I've actually never thought about this. Because this goes completely outside of my flow of teaching. Well, you should try. You should try just coming off a of March break camp where you have to do this with eighteen goalies at a time. <laughs> well, that's yeah. That's why I didn't do a March break camp. And not, well, there you go. Not, 
because of breakaways and not because I'm super busy. Uh, uh, yeah, I would probably say I, I would think about a foot outside the crease is probably a good place to start as a guide, like a guide. Yeah. And then it just gives you a little bit of room to be able to retreat, but not too much where you get lost and not so far back that you get back to probably about a foot or a skate flank, maybe you know, a skate flank. No, I, don't, I mean, the one that I always default to is one or two steps out from your crease is what I always say. Um, yeah, but and, then you're going through some massive deep push out and you're like, ha, ah, that's yeah, bad, and really. guess, and, yeah, and guess what? Then you fix it, right? Like, I also don't have a ruler out there that if I told a girl a foot, they're going to pull out the ruler and measure that equally, right? And again, okay, so I get it. Like like all things, it's obviously context specific. But I get. It. I wanted to put that um put that on your table, or put that into the uh, the, the question because I think at some point you know general starting points, especially for people um, who are listening again who might not be goalie coaches or might be parents of goalies who don't play the position themselves. Right. Just being mindful of that. I think those are some general recommendations. I ultimately think that it's entirely uh, preference. Like I just think it's. I think breakaways are one of those. One of those things where it's like there's so much feel to it, and there's going to be so many individual differences that unless un, unless there's something that's causing a repeatable problem, I'm pretty laid back about how goalies want to play breakaways. I don't really, I don't actively teach breakaways that much, or almost never, unless a goalie comes to me and says I have been getting absolutely roasted on breakaways. Then they'll say, okay, let me see you take some breakaways. And then it's usually a patience or they're getting way too wide or their hands are collapsing, some, something like that. Uh, just because like when it comes to practice, you're taking so many breakaways all the time, whether they're serious or fun. Uh, yeah. So if someone's, and then usually goalies will be able to come and figure out some, some sort of way to play it. But if they're getting consistently, 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 then, then I just identify and then say, okay, what is like the biggest problem that if I can solve is going to make the most amount of difference? And it's usually, like I said, get, get it wide or some sort of patience. And then mm-hmm. adjust those. Let them take 100, 200 more breakaways over the course of a week or two. If they don't get any better, are they? did they actually apply it? And if they did, then it, what was the issue? Let's try again. And then rinse and repeat until, you, until something works. Yeah. And to kind of wrap up this conversation, maybe I'll kind of leave, leave you, Jimmy, with the three things that I teaches staples as part of my break because remember the context that i'm coming from is sometimes i have to teach a concept to lots of goalies at the same time i'm not the elite goalie method unfortunately i don't have this unlimited private ice time ability so cool of you though um hey yeah i and even and summer camp schedules should be dropping but i'm not a big you know you know my opinion on massive camps okay we're out here all doing our best um the point being the three things that I always teach is foundations to breakaways. And especially when you got to teach breakaways, younger goalies, maybe they need some tips, some pointers, some things to focus on. But sometimes when you do this with the older goalies, 20, 21 year olds need some reminders sometimes too. The things that I always say is one, you mentioned it already, you got to kind of match speed to some degree. And you don't need to have the exact same speed. I think goalies think that sometimes like match the exact speed of the player. No, it's like if a player is coming in with more speed, you need to um, retreat quicker. Yeah. That's the you know not rocket science there. Um, that's number one. There's a relative matching speed component with our retreat. Number two, you need quiet feet and you need quiet feet early. Uh, if you're if you're C cutting when a player makes moves, see you later. Like goodbye, it's over. Down it, it's glitch. Take it out of the net. Right. So many times, goalies fall backwards, goalies fall sideways over the back because their feet aren't quiet when they're retreating on a breakaway. You see it at every level. It happens in the NHL sometimes too. Right. Um, especially when a player comes in with more speed. So that's number two. And the number three thing, which I find myself saying more and more and more lately than I'm even getting annoyed with my own voice, is that goalies in tight need to have active hands. They need to be forward. They need to be taking away net. And every time your hands are back and a player is in tight, every, the players are just too good now. It doesn't work. You need those hands to be active and smothering in tight. What are your thoughts on those three? I really like all three. I think those are good. I'm probably going to use that as a clip for social media and for coaching because I think that that I think that was a, that was really well said. And I think you know for something that is very complicated, 
I actually don't stop. It's something that's very tricky to coach. I think that's a pretty good guideline as well to to give some goalies who might be struggling or have no idea how to play a breakaway a good starting point and then play with it those and, and develop a system that works for you. Uh, before we go, I just right when I whenever I think about hands coming forward and breakaway, I just think of Kari Lett. Yeah, man. Remember, like, remember how wide it is how his hands. He did such a good job of getting his hands forward, but like he just got so wide. I actually have a picture that we use in we in camp. We do like video and like some PowerPoint stuff, which is very funny. It feels very classroom. We do some classroom stuff at our camps, and I actually have a picture that I show of Carter Lettman uh, playing for Team Finland. I don't know where it's from, but it's just like the world's widest stance. His back is like is basically a flat board. He's so wide and bent over. But his hands are just like three feet out from his body. Uh, the play is pretty in tight when he's doing that. It's a pretty wild stance without context, which I show it to the kids without context, and then explain it afterwards. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I like that. I like that. I also think Kari Light is possibly has some of the best pads when he played Atlanta. Oh my gosh, I know, I know there's whispers of Atlanta coming back. Hopefully, the color scheme is the same because if someone could recreate those pads with like a digit yeah oh my oh my goodness oh and so shout out friend of the program grand total spent some time yeah. in atlanta yeah that is true, that is and true. another hamilton girly shout out that we would be remiss not to include right that's true we do we do love the 905 the southern ontario corner the south the central area. west niagara gta region love it although it is sort of getting all engulfed by the gta so it's now all yeah, it's nothing anymore. Well, welcome to Ontario. All right, Jamie, that's all I think we need to really cover this episode. We kind of got a couple different things discussed. Everything that I wanted to talk about really that's been on my mind lately, whether it's overlaps, whether it's kind of being more consistent with our starting positions. And then we kind of, you know, got carried away as we always do on a few different things. Do you have a closing gripe or a closing uh, sales pitch for us today? Maybe? Uh, closing gripe? No, sales pitch, the... GM program right now. Uh, I filled the spots for this opening, last opening. So we're back on the wait list. However, if you join the wait list, you get uh, early access. And so whatever, I open spots. Like I didn't open spots to the public this time because wait list goalies filled up. Uh, really, everything you need to basically become the best goalie you can be off ice training, on ice, edge work, uh, brought in some mental coaches. There's mental coaching involved very in-depth pro- program just go to elitebullymethod.com to find out more that is my uh that is my chef sales pitch because i really enjoy doing that and i enjoy the success that a lot of these bullies are having so uh, if you're interested like i said elitebullymethod.com check it out read about it see if it's for you and then if you think so join the wait list and when i open up spots for it at the, uh april maybe you'll be lucky to get it this is a good sales pitch i'll add another one uh, as always, Jay mentioned before, but definitely if you're interested in some more goaltending content, that is pretty good and worth your time and money. Go check out Jamie's Patreon. That's uh, a great place to learn. It's got amazing content that I don't make a cent off of. So, you know. Well, imagine, you know, imagine my sales pitch if I was making money on it. My final great, my final pitch of the week. We aside, can bend some gear. Let's just get, if you work for a hockey company. There it is. You want to, you want to sponsor the pot. We doesn't matter. The company Ben will wear it. We'll make content. It will be unbelievable. And we have a sponsorship package. Uh, we would talk about that, obviously, and get something set up so that we can have a presenting sponsor for the Glue Attack Spot. I want nothing more than to review the latest set of pads and explain how uh, Bauer, if, if you're listening, um, we're waiting for our proprietary checks because. Jamie, you and I had no straps on our bowers before that became the stock option. Yeah, that is true. And I was one of the first boys with the 580, and now every goalie wants a 580. Uh, the bower 580, excuse me. Let's clarify. Bower 580. Yeah. Uh, so I, so I, hey, would, I, I would like some commission on that. I was going to say, our check is just probably in the mail. Like, uh, probably, you, this time of year. It might have done yeah, it's, I I've we've moved a lot, you know. It's it's hard to keep track. So, you know, the hour of my birthday's coming up, man. Surprise! <laughs> yeah, that's my pitch. Um, I will. Uh, yeah, we'll do anything. <laughs>
All right. On that note, everyone, thank you as always for listening. Um, everyone who's come up and seen Jamie or I in person and has mentioned that you like the podcast. We appreciate all of you. Um, we love doing this. We hope it's informative and we hope you have as much fun as we do. So Jamie, until next time.